So that's our setup for the next couple of days. I'm sorry it requires quite a lot of talking from me. So now I'm delighted to put you in the hands of a true, true leader and to introduce our first keynote speaker for the conference. And remember, this is under the sub-theme of Engage. And it's about action and advocacy for change. And I'm thrilled and privileged to be introducing our first keynote speaker, Lily Tharpa. Lily is the founding chairperson of Women for Human Rights, WHR, single women widows group in Nepal that has been working for the social, political, economic and legal rights of single women in Nepal and South Asia for the past 20 years. She's also a founding member of Sankalpa, which is a women's alliance for peace, justice and democracy and is currently serving as vice chairperson of that organisation. Lily established the South Asian Network for Women's Empowerment and Development in 2003 and serves as its General Secretary. Under this, this incredibly transformational leadership, WHR and this grassroots movement of widows has grown from one small room to a global level. By profession, Ms Thapa is Lecturer of Sociology and Gender in the University of Nepal and Conflict Development and Peace Studies in Pawanchal University in Nepal. Her efforts have been recognised by multiple national and international awards. Today, Lily, at the helm of WHR, has given a new horizon of hope to over half a million women and three incredibly successful sons and proud daughters-in-law, constantly working to uplift and empower them to create a world where there will be no discrimination on the basis of marital status. She'll be speaking to us today about her own personal journey, which has led her to work for social transformation for the lives of widows in Nepal, Please be generous in your welcome to Lily Thapa. My dream. My dream was to become the first female prime minister of my country. It was not always my dream. I wanted a normal life with simple dreams like eating good food, wearing good clothes. But things took a different turn. So did my simple dreams. I am a widow, but I'm still me. Of course, I mourn and I shed tears. But to carry an alone, I deserve dignity and respect, not the fears and the humiliation. This poem is me and every widow. A very good morning to everyone here. I came all the way from a very small and beautiful Himalayan country, Nepal, just to share about the social movements that I'm engaged for the widows in Nepal. I wasn't always a widow, of course. I was first born as a daughter, then when I get married, then I was reborn as a wife and then the mother. But when my husband died, then I was born again as a widow. And this third birth was really, really challenging for me. And it has changed my whole life forever. My first life began well. I was born into a Wela family in Kathmandu city and I bloomed like a very stunning lily in the garden of my parents and I was charming and precious and then I became aware of the societal expectations. I became aware that the reputation of a daughter represents the reputation of whole families, that her chastity means everything for her and her entire clan. My chastity, I couldn't believe. I rebelled. I rebelled again and again this, against the society, against the very patriarchy that made my mother bow down her, feet, her head at her husband's feet. I wanted to study, to learn more about the world and complete my higher education. But my father, my father who was ill, wanted to see his daughter get married. And so I married to an army doctor from a very well-off family when I was just 17. It was the next incarnation of my life, one where I had to leave my parents' house and move to my in-law's house. I changed from a daughter to the daughter-in-law, 
and I had to build and maintain my relations with the new people and the new household as a 17-year-old teenager. The harshest form of the marriage in South Asia is an early marriage. It limits a girl's education, increase her vulnerability to violence, and increase the chances of the teen pregnancy, and restricts her the decision-making authority within the family, and undervalues her status in the household and the family. When I become a daughter-in-law, formal study was no longer options, and I hated this. But I accepted my fate, and then destiny cheated me. One day, I got the news that my husband died while serving as a UN peacekeeper in Iraq in Gulf War. I had three young children. I was just 29. When I heard the news, I fainted. And I didn't wake up until hours. When I did, I could tell that everything had changed. I was not allowed to touch anything. I was forced to sit in one corner, and I had to throw all the colorful dresses and the red colored dresses and the jewelry that I had been wearing since my childhood because I had become a widow. It was the darkest day of my life. My in-laws switched from loving ones to the hateful ones. They called me omnius. They said that I snatched their son. They blamed me for everything. And as it was a sign from above, there was a common terminology used to all the widows in our country, is a husband eater. And our marriage vase that was decorated with lily cracked suddenly after 12 years. My husband's dead body was brought back from Iraq. And my sons, who was also very small, began fulfilling the traditional death rituals for their father. At that tender age of 29, I had no idea about my future age, what life would surprise me with. Before this incident, I had never realized that women should stand on their own feet. When I had to admit my children in the school for their education, I had no money, no other options than asking for the property of my husband. As I was quite young, I had no such idea how could I have access to the property of my husband to admit uh, to the children in good schools because of the legal policies which says a widow have to be 35 years of age to inherit in the husband's property. And this was really, really shocking news for me. When we talk about the death rituals in my country, we need to talk about sati. It, it, it was a system where widows would be tied up on the death pyre of our husbands and burned to death. Many of you have read in the paper as well, because if the husband is dead, she should die too. That system is over now. But have things really changed? No. Widows are still living physically, but socially they are dead. A newly widowed woman must follow societal rituals. These rules and rituals deliberately diminish her perceived attractiveness, inhibit her sexual power and increase her vulnerability. A widow becomes the prey of physical and sexual assaults and harassments and is scolded with the rough words and she's accused of various crimes and sexual misdeeds. And she's outcast from the property and restrictions on her mobility and on food. Hindu mythologies stress that a widow must follow all these kind of restrictions as well as to maintain her chastity throughout her life. I was forced to a new incarnation of my life, one of widowhood. For the first time in my life, I felt lonely and disliked. Until I lost my husband, I had never realized that how society so often defines women by the men in their lives. 
Our identity as women is fluid and but always dependent on men. When she is born, she takes the father's surname in my country. When she gets married, she has to take the surname of her husband. When she has the children, then she is addressed as somebody, somebody's mother. It made me ponder where I existed on my own. I had never expected that alone with the death of my husband, I have to sacrifice all my desires, interests, and my hobbies. I hadn't even completed the first chapter of my life and was doomed by my husband's death. My little son's queries his father were the most painful thing for me, though the other two were little consoled saying that he has gone to meet God. I could do nothing than avoiding his queries, telling a lie and crying silently. His questions would pull me back towards the pressure of nurturing my three little birds into the mature flowers. I cried, I cried for my, I not, do not cry for my dead husbands, but I cry for the future of my little children, so as are the widows. In Nepal, as per the census 2011, 82% of the widows in Nepal is totally illiterate. Can you imagine? and 67% of the widows are in between 20 to 35 years of age, having three to four children in an average. How does a widowed woman without her husband's property educate and nurture her children? I started thinking, with why these restrictions to a young widow? This discriminatory legal policy made me feel time and again that I should fight against these unfair systems. And this was the first victory of my life when I won the cases through the Supreme Court that the widows no longer need to be 35 years of age to inherit in her deceased husband's property. In the Nepalese context, the chastity of the widow is directly linked up with the treatment of the family. If any of the three relatives of the dead husbands blame the widowed wife having her extramarital affairs with someone else, she is totally legally outcast getting the property of a deceased husband. And we have many, many cases in our office. This freedom allowed the in-laws to defame the widowed woman, question her chastity, and abandon her from the husband's property. Many of our sisters were facing the same problem. And after continuous lobby and the advocacy with the government, we have been succeed to change these laws as well. And no one can restrict a widow on her property rights just because of her chastity. As a widow, I couldn't participate in the ceremonies. You must be very surprised to know this. And I couldn't participate, especially in these religious ceremonies. And I couldn't wear the red and the bright colorful dresses after becoming the widow. No widows can wear on that. And the restri restrictions existed everywhere. Widows were not even allowed to meet their parents until a year of their husband's death. We have a one year of mourning period. And most of the widows are believed to be inauspicious and are not invited to participate in any kind of a function to religious occasions. They are treated to be someone omnious and brings misfortunes in life. I will share you one incident. I remember when one of my brother-in-law was getting married and I was invited to, when I saw all the senior women of my relatives carrying a trays of the gifts for a bride and I wanted to help them. And all of a sudden, one of my relatives came and approached me that there are many others who could do this. You don't need to do this. Then I understood the underlying meanings. She and many other women, they didn't want me to touch the auspicious tray because I am in auspicious as per their rules. And this event dismayed me so much that from that day onwards, I started thinking about who has made these discriminatory practices in the name of culture and religion. And the incident forced me to ponder into a fact why not a man is restric restricted to do various things after he loses his wife? 
There's nothing to's and don'ts for the women, men who lost their wife. A man marries another woman just after fulfilling 13 days of death rituals. But a wife, when she gets widowed, her whole life gets doomed. In addition, I started thinking myself, if an educated woman from the city had to go through all these superstitions, then what would be the other women who are uneducated and belong to a marginalized family? I like red colors. I like bright colors. And in a red color and the bright color is considered as a species color in our country. But the widows in our country are not allowed to wear red and bright colors. And we cannot eat even non-vegetarian food and has to maintain the chastity and follow many more restrictions. I was astonished to discover the fact that these all restrictions have been linked up with the sexuality of widows. As you know, when we wear the red and bright colors, we look pretty, we look beautiful. When we eat non-vegetarian food, and you know, non-vegetarian food increase the sexuality of any women and men. And in fear of the getting defamed by the society and losing her rights to her husband's property, the widows gets silenced. As a result of these sociocultural stigmas that widows take into the depressions and they are psychologically traumatized. All these restrictions further stigmatize the widows to have a life full of seclusion, even they can't enjoy their rights to body. A question always clicked me why there are so many do's and don'ts for the widows. One fateful day, when I met a young girl, Lakshmi from a village, who had been living the most painful life after her husband's death, I could meet her after a long struggle as she was not allowed to meet anyone from outside. When I saw her and talked to her, I realized how hard life is for a young widow in my country. Lakshmi was just 22 and had to keep sexual relations to her brother-in-law. If she denied doing so, he would beat her two-year-old son and threaten that he won't let child eat. Even if the whole family knows about the fact they couldn't revolt back because he was the only breadwinner of that family. My encounter with Lakshmi made me realize that the pain I have been going through is very, very less in comparison to Lakshmi. Then I realized the level of the stress Lakshmi could feel after sharing her ooze with me. And poor me, I had nothing to offer her than the words of the courage and the consolation. Then later I could help her learn swing and come out of her tragedy and to relieve her life. Now Lakshmi is a big businesswoman in the village right now. And this incident fueled me from my inner heart to collect the widows from my circle and organize daily talks where they would be able to share their challenges and sufferings. In the initial phase, it was incredibly challenging to bring out the widows from the four walls of their homes, and it was directly connected to the maintenance of the chastity. Slowly and gradually, many of my friends and relatives started summing up in the Sunday Forum, which I felt was quite similar to confessions room in the Chaucis. The women shared their ooze in the mass, closing all the windows, and doors of the room in the fear that someone outsider would listen to them and they have to end up with the forum. And the Sunday forum become a platform for helping widows transform their sorrows into strengths. They learned to be independent and achieve what they wanted to without any discrimination. And the Sunday forum paved its way towards the legitimate establishment of organizations called Women for Human Rights Single Women Groups with the motto that no discrimination on the basis of the marital status. And the Sunday Forum has now transformed into a big national widows uh, forum in the country 
and has been able to mobilize more than 100,000 widows as the change agents in the community. And this is the largest NGO in my country right now. And WHR, Women for Human Rights, is one of the first kind of organization in Nepal with the aim of developing widows as a change agents by providing capacity building trainings, socioeconomic and legal empowerment, and thus mobilizing them towards the mainstream of the development. And also, uh, another focus of my organization has been to pressurize the government to address the issues of the widows and to mainstream the widows' issues into the development agenda. I'm proud that now WHR's door is the first door where widows knock after their husband's death. And the first achievement of WHR became the passing of the national declaration using the word of single women instead of the widows in Nepali, because the word widow in Nepali society is viewed with humiliation and agony. Also, it has been able to change and reform various discriminatory laws and have further stigmatized widows' women. The major step carried out was lobbying the government to collect the data of widows in the national level, in the census. The fact-finding helped WHR's movement to be more specific and straightforward. As a result, Nepal is the second country in South Asia after India having a data on widowhood at the national level. And WHR have also created the benchmarks in the Nepalese legal systems by reforming various discriminatory legal policies like rights to inherit without waiting the age of 35 years of age. I personally filed the case in my name to the Supreme Court and it has become the precedent now. And rights to retain the late husband's property after remarries, otherwise no widows will get the property rights if she gets remarried. And rights to widows uh, allowances irrespective of age, otherwise widows have to be 60 years of age to have a um, government's allowances. And rights to obtain the passport without male consent and rights to sell or hand over her share of property without the consent of her son. Moreover, WHR transformed its member into change agents, as a change makers, who become the development defenders in their local area. The groups, the single women groups, are viewed as women's peace initiatives. At the grassroots level, as much initiation has come from within these groups in hopes of managing and resolving the conflict in the community. As WHR is one of the pioneering organizations in the issues of the widows, it has also contributed in forming a network of the conflict-affected widows called Nispaksha that works together a lot for just an equitable, peaceful society. WHR has now covers more than 2,500 villages uh, in 73 districts out of 75 in my country and has more than 100,000 members. Most of them are young widows. And it, it has also set up a 19 shelter homes. Uh, we call it chaharis, a shed of a trees, where widows can come and stay and have social and psychological counseling to regain the self-confidence. And WHR is also able to mainstream the issues of the widowhood as a fundamental issues in the present constitutions of Nepal. And the Ministry of the Women has set up an emergency fund solely for the widows of Nepal and providing small kind of a support to live their li life with dignity. And the Nepalese government also provides the small stipend like allowances to all the widows regardless of age. And WHR as being a Secretariat of South Asian Network for the Widows Movement has been able to incorporate the issues of the widowhood in the Colombo declarations uh, in 2008. Through constant lobbying and the awareness raising initiatives, we have been successfully changed a lot of our discriminatory legal policies against the widows in our country. Like the deceased, as I already mentioned, the deceased husband's property no longer needs to be returned after remarriage because we just wanted to uh, encourage the young widow to get remarried. 
and selling or changing property ownership doesn't require the consent of our adult sons and the unmarried daughters and the widows no longer need to be 35 years to obtain the property and the widows do not have to be remain on the chastity of her deceased husband to inherit property and there was one policy from the government just three years back that who marries the widows gets 50,000 Nepalese rupees and we are totally against that proposals of government and we amended, we've been successful to amend that policy through the Supreme Court. And the widows no longer need to take a permission of our male family members to obtain passport. And the government just recently announced the practice of child marriage uh, as an ill practice that should not be continued because we have in some of our, some parts of our country most of the girls get married before first menstruation and they go to their house after first menstruation but in the meantime if the boy died or the boys didn't come to take, take her bride and she is considered as a half widow we have a terminology called baikalya she is child widow she doesn't inherit property from any of nor from the parents nor from the husbands just because of the success at the policy level advocacy we have WHR have received a special consultative status in Koshak in 2011 and we've been continuously highlighting the issues of the widows into the CEDA and the CSW Commission on the Status of the Women. Our broader goal is to empower widows, improve and sustain the living condition of widows and advocate for the widows rights globally to reduce inequalities, poverty and hardship for widows. The major crux lies the fact that the developed countries are unaware of the such a severe human rights violations that occurs in the name of the widowhood, especially in the South Asian region. And we have a lot of facts of that, those kind of human rights violations from the South African country as well. And the Australian government and the affiliations can support this movement by assisting de by developing the widows as a human rights defenders. Not only that, we look forward to work, work together with the international agencies to mainstream the issues of the widows into the international development agenda and to incorporate the issues of the widows in international human rights instruments. Till now, no human rights instruments like CEDA, CSW, Beijing have not included widow's issues as a specific concern on the human rights area. We also have to work together with developed countries to acknowledge that widows as social capital for peace building and development. We do expect support to the immediate services to the highly vulnerable widows and their children particularly those widows by the conflict and the natural disasters. And we recently just have a big natural disaster of earthquake. And I'm seeing our ex-president from NRN, Mr. Seskali, has been engaged to make the houses for the disaster victim. I re really urge him to give more priority to the widows in that village as well. And additionally, there lies a huge gaps between the international NGO and the local level NGOs, CSOs like us, as they lack direct links with one another. And WHR also requires the necessary resources that are needed to sustain our movement. And there is also a need to equip human resources to be mobilized in the field. If WHR can build the leadership ability of the widows, their dependents and the other youths, then many foot soldiers could be equipped for the future who can who can continue this movement. And this readiness would prepare future potential widows for defending, capacitating, and be raising voices on their own. And the first and the foremost is of breaking the iron gate that omits the widow freely enter the restrictions from the societal privileges. There are also dire need of supporting widows in facilitating their participation in decision-making level as a skill training, income generation programs that can help them be less vulnerable to violence and exploitation. Many widows migrate to urban centers and take on foreign employment in the hope of finding employment to feed themselves and to their children, where again the poverty and the powerlessness 
leave them vulnerable to the worst forms of exploitation and modern slavery, including trafficking. Despite of many achievements and development work have happened on widowhood, globally, there is much more to be achieved. There is still discrimination, violence and harassment inflicted upon widows in South Asia and especially in Nepal, but I'm ready. I'm ready to face more challenges, ready to give widows and women in South Asia and globally the respect that we deserve and ready to take on my dream of making many, many widows at the decision making level. Thank you all for being so patient and thank you all for listening and thank you for having me here. Good day. I think you could tell from the quietness in the room how compelling your story was, Lily, and thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, and I think it reminds us of many things, certainly that out of adversity comes strength, but enormous sophistication in the way that you have taken your own um, sad and uh, difficult start into something that's changed the lives of many other women. So once again, if I can ask the audience just to acknowledge your courage and your determination. There is a roving mic and we have the opportunity, if that's okay, Lily, if there are some questions that people want to ask, if you can uh, indicate by showing a hand and just identifying who you are perhaps while we're waiting for the audience to be brave. I just wanted to say I visited Nepal after the earthquake and, and we met a young girl with a profound disability who, who was in a school and we were, were interested to hear her story. And we had this, uh, what I would call a surreal moment uh, where with her mother's permission, we were filming her at school and I looked at the document she was reading, which was a, an English class, and the first line that we read was, in Nepal, the men are the head of the family, and they have this role to be the leaders. Words to that effect. I guess my question is, uh, you know, how confident are you that, I guess, the kind of equality that you're striving for for widows and the incredible achievements that you've managed to get for widows can really translate so that we can see women in political power, women in leadership positions in a country like Nepal. Thank you so much. Um, you know, in Nepal, basically talking about the family matter is totally prohibited here. Nobody wanted to interfere in the family matter. But the work that we've been doing, bringing widows out from the house and transforming her as a leader is, is really been challenging because of the family values, because of the cultural practices, the widows uh, do not come out of the houses. And because of the, you know, the data, because of the education level, because of the skills uh, pro program, the widows are not that much empowered enough to come and, uh, and, and, and be a change agents in the community. It's really, really challenging for us to interfere into the family matters. In the beginning, it was really challenging to bring the widows from out of the house. And it took almost 10 years to make the widows groups in the community. It was not an easy task for us because we have to go through the families, we have to go through the community, and we have to revolt against the cultural practices which is attached to the religion. And you know, in my country, revolting uh, religious practices is really, really challenging. So it was really uh, difficult for me in the beginning. But now, if you just look at the, I can, I can just compare 10 years back and right now, 10 years back, the widows are 
confined into the four walls of the home, but now more than 100,000 has been organized and mobilized as a change agents. But now, uh, and then the other things that I proudly say that the widows are now being accepted in the community and as well as in the family as well as a big uh, social capital resources in the community because of the movement that the widows has been engaged in the community. It was really challenging. As you talk about the earthquake, if you look at the data of the government, more than 52% uh, who has been affected by the earthquake were the women. And we have a PD and we have a uh, report from the government where among the 52% of the women, 28% were the female household, female headed households who has been directly affected by the earthquake that time. And the, and the women, the single women, the he female headed household, they are so much vulnerable because of many things, because they don't have a male support at that time. And the thing is that they are the solely breadwinner of that uh, houses. And they are not been able to, even not been able to go on the line to get the, you know, kind of a support the, the government and the other NGOs has been providing at that time. Because they have to take care of their family as well as that time and they have to go on the line to get the compensation. And the most challenging thing is that most of the widows have lost their documents, you know, the legal documents, the citizenship, the marriage certificate and the property ownership certificate. That is really challenging, and we've been working on that, how they have access with the, all these legal documents back. And I think the challenge for many of the organisations, including my own in this room, is that we need to really be mindful of the, our own policies of uh, understanding that women are most adversely impacted during a humanitarian crisis, like an earthquake, and that how we reach out to them is really critical. Can I ask you maybe too personal a question? What has the reaction been of your family over the years, and particularly to your children, when they see your activism and they see what a change you've actually made for widows across the country? It was not an easy task. I will say you frankly that I attempted suicide two times in the past, when immediately after my husband's death. You know, uh, it was, I was just, very young at that time. I was not that much bold, you know. I was not much aware of the many legal things at that time. But it was not an easy task to work for the widows that time. And my children were very young, very small that time, and I had to take care of my children as well as to lead the movement of the widows' rights that time. It was not an easy task. You know, when I started the red color campaign, because uh, as you said, the red colors probably, you know, can, we can't wear the red and the bright colors. When I started the red color campaign, then every day there was a lot of a nasty things written in the paper that the lily have started spoiling the cultural practices in our country. There are a lot of things in the headline of the paper. And my mother's always asking me not to work on that thing because you've been, you know, uh, mis- uh, treating by the uh, religious, uh, uh, religious leaders and from the community, spoiling the cultural practices. You know, it was really, really challenging in the beginning and my three sons, basically I got support from my mother. You know, she came and started staying with me and looking for my children so that I can fully engage in the development, the movement of the widows that time. So if I didn't get the support from my mother, I would not be here and my movement would not be here at, the, at this stage. So it was really challenging, but for now, more not only my children, most of my family, my relatives and my friends are very proud of the movement that we've been doing right now. And it's because of the changes that we've been, we've been succeed to bring in the community uh, for the rights of the widows. So our works have been acknowledged not only by the community, but has been acknowledged by the government as well. Just recently, you know, we had our constitutions, new constitutions. We have a lot of a transformations in our country. The country is going through the uh, new federal structure. So the government have been acknowledged putting the widow's rights as a fundamental rights in the new constitutions. That was a huge achievement for uh, all the widows in my country. And beside that, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And beside that, even the Ministry of the Women have set up a big emergency fund for the widows.
so that the widows have uh, in, you know access of the small kind of uh, support to fight for the legal cases to do some kind of income generation programs and to support them for the education of their children so the thing is that the government have also acknowledged the issues of the widowed into the development agenda that's a huge a huge achievement for all of us so lily can i say that your newfound friends and colleagues here in australia are also proud of your efforts we really want to acknowledge that uh, out of a personal context you've made massive change in a country where much change is yet to occur and behalf of everyone at the Sackford conference can i ask you to take this small token of appreciation but again, can I ask you all to acknowledge the incredibly powerful story that we've heard today of a change movement and a personal journey from a very brave woman. Lily, thank you. Thank you so much.